To learn more about earning college credits with study hall courses, go to gostudyhall.com or click the link in the description. Let's talk about the three most exhausting letters in the English language, DMV. Whenever you need to get a new license or renew your existing license or register your vehicle, it's a whole process. You need to pull together specific documents that show your age and where you live. Then you need to navigate a website that looks like it hasn't been updated since the internet was invented to try to book an appointment that may not be available for weeks. Then you still need to take a day off work to stand in the longest, slowest line on earth and hopefully manage the parallel park correctly on the first try. I did. All that just to get stuck with the worst photo you've ever taken for the next decade. The endless paperwork and confusing instructions and bad websites we deal with when we're trying to get a passport or renew a license or pay our taxes is a pain. It's slow moving and frustrating and intimidating. But there must be a reason for it all, right? Yes. It all comes down to a hard to spell French looking word, bureaucracy. Hi. I'm Dave Jorgensen, and believe it or not, that's also me in that photo. And this is Study Hall, Power in Politics and U.S. Government. Bureaucracy refers to the hierarchy of offices and institutions that administer organizations, in our case, the government. And there are more than 21 million people who work in state, local, and federal agencies. They're called civil servants, or bureaucrats. These 21 million bureaucrats include everything from tax collectors to park rangers to people at the DMV, who all work in public administration, which means they make sure the government and society run smoothly. Bureaucracies exist all over the world, from Latin America to Europe to Africa, because you can't have a functioning government without public administration to support it. But even though all these people are working for the government, in the U.S., most bureaucratic positions are unelected. And while bureaucratic agency leaders often have to be appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate, a lot of bureaucrats are longtime government employees who stick around president after president. And they're notoriously hard to fire due to special protections for federal employees. So it can be hard to ensure accountability and efficiency in these roles. But it used to be even worse. Because of their close ties to political offices, the bureaucracy used to be way more political. In the 1800s, when a new administration came into the White House, it was customary for the president to return favors and reward allies with jobs, even if those friends weren't really qualified for the position. This vintage version of nepotism was known as the spoil system, and it characterized the federal bureaucracy for most of the 1800s. And the shady assignment of jobs that happened under the spoil system was called patronage. People took patronage seriously deadly seriously. When President Garfield didn't give a supporter a job, the supporter literally assassinated him. Garfield's assassination inspired reform efforts throughout the country, and we started to move from the spoil system to something more merit-based. People had to use their experience to qualify for jobs, instead of their LinkedIn connections. But my dog is on LinkedIn, and you should follow her there. During its reform era, Congress passed the Civil Service Reform Act of 1883. Known as the Pendleton Act, it created a merit system where people got jobs based on their past performance, score in the civil service exam, and other qualifications. To ease people into this new system, only about 10% of federal jobs started under the merit system. This included certain jobs in DC, as well as all post offices and custom houses with 50 or more employees. Over time, the merit system grew to include almost all government jobs. Nowadays, the vast majority of bureaucratic positions are filled based on educational and professional requirements, though some still go to the guys with the highest Brook Brothers loyalty status. This makes sense because a lot of jobs now require specialized training, like air traffic controllers. Think of how unsafe you'd feel if I, a person with no knowledge of airplanes, was doing that job. But this can also create its own unlevel playing field because expensive college and training are out of reach for so many people. As we moved away from the spoil system, the federal bureaucracy also expanded, especially throughout the 1900s. After all, it takes a lot of government to respond to nationwide issues like the Great Depression and two world wars. During the Great Depression, the US suffered bank collapses, business closures, and droughts across 75% of the country. In the early 1930s, 25% of people were unemployed more than six times the unemployment rate in 2023. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, also known as FDR, thought the only way to respond to unprecedented economic disaster was with unprecedented government expansion. During his first 100 days in office, FDR pushed 15 major laws through Congress that focus on economic recovery, like the Emergency Banking Act that helped rebuild confidence in our banks. 
And during his many terms, he created dozens of new agencies and added millions of people to the federal bureaucracy. FDR's legacy of bureaucratic expansion was carried on by other presidents throughout the following decades, really until Ronald Reagan became president in 1981. Reagan famously campaigned against bureaucracy, pulling on the small government heartstrings of conservative voters. But obviously, the bureaucracy is still around, and today it's a multifaceted being. Millions of civil servants act as the face of the federal government. When we interact with them, we're directly connecting with the bureaucracy. When you go through airport security, a federal employee confiscates your expensive perfume that's one ounce over the limit. When you visit national parks, a federal employee reminds you to safely store your food to avoid attracting skunks to your tent. Because if you don't, you'll really need that perfume TSA just took away. In doing their jobs, bureaucrats provide public goods and solve collective action problems, like ensuring that airports run smoothly. All of these civil servants fit into the bigger structure of the federal bureaucracy. Think of it like a big bureaucratic org chart. At the top, we have the president. Then there's the cabinet, which is made up of 15 people who are each the head of a cabinet department, like the departments of defense, transportation, or education. The cabinet head oversees agencies within each department. For example, the head of the Department of Justice oversees the FBI, and the head of the Department of the Treasury oversees the IRS. There are also independent agencies, which kind of govern themselves and don't directly work for the president, though the president does appoint their leaders, who also need to be approved by the Senate. Independent agencies are smaller than cabinet departments and tend to work in more specific areas, like NASA. So bureaucrats can be productive. I mean, they literally send people to the moon like 50 years ago. We also have government corporations, which are mostly separate from the government's oversight. Their funding usually comes from the services they provide, like the USPS or Amtrak, Biden's favorite. But Congress still supports government corporations when needed. For example, Congress helped out the USPS when they were struggling during COVID. That government support was vital because the USPS is the only way that some people can get mail across our giant country. So that all seems fine, but it doesn't really explain why our interactions with the bureaucracy bureaucracy can be such an exhausting experience. What does explain that, partly, is laws. When you think of bureaucracy, at least on the federal level, you're thinking of the executive branch of the U.S. government. And their job is often to enforce the laws that the legislative branch, or Congress, passes. And Congress doesn't want the bureaucracy to have too much power or creativity when it comes to enforcing the laws. So they write very long laws in super specific ways. The more specific and detailed Congress can get, the less room there is for the bureaucracy's interpretation and rulemaking. And that means we end up with laws that are hundreds of pages long. But even within those super long laws, we end up with confusing language and gray areas that are difficult for bureaucrats to enforce. For example, if Congress passed a law allowing the EPA to regulate, quote, standing waters, that would create questions about what exactly standing waters are. Can the EPA regulate ditches? Ponds? The puddle in that pothole in I-95? To make sense of these gray areas, agencies use rulemaking to come up with more specific regulations to make sense of laws. Rules help bureaucrats to wade through legislative complexity, but before they're implemented, rules go through a pretty lengthy process. Like, say the EPA wants to clarify that they can regulate the puddle on I-95 as long as it's more than 16 inches across and 2.5 inches deep. First, proposed rules are published in the Federal Register, which is a daily publication listing all sorts of new rules. Sounds fun. After that, there's a period of notice and comment where interest groups can submit their complaints or request for amendments. Like if truck drivers think the puddle should actually be at least three inches deep for it to fall under the EPA's jurisdiction. Or if the local Save the Mosquitoes group thinks they should be in charge of the puddle instead. These comments tend to be biased towards the special interests of each group, which benefits their members, but can make the process even longer. To avoid this, some agencies have adopted a more neutral method of negotiated rulemaking, where interest groups are brought together to reach a consensus on a rule before sending feedback to the agency. So the truck drivers and the mosquito group would need to work together at last to submit feedback they're both happy with. Then the EPA can make changes to their proposed rule based on the feedback. They likely don't agree that save the mosquitoes should regulate the puddle, so they would ignore that feedback. But maybe they do take the truck driver's suggestion of changing the dimensions. Once they make the changes, the rule is implemented, and now the EPA knows exactly what standing waters they can regulate. For a more real-life example, in 1996, Congress passed a law requiring the protection of a patient's medical history. But that's really vague. Does that mean hospital staff still discuss patient details? Can doctors in different networks discuss a patient who's transferring between their care? 
To answer some of these questions, the Department of Health and Human Services passed the HIPAA Privacy and Security Rules. HIPAA outlined medical procedures to ensure that patient privacy was protected. So that means we can rest assured our medical records are private because of actions from the bureaucracy. Despite the bureaucracy's complications and imperfections, inefficiencies, and just generally being exhausting, we depend on it every day. The millions of federal, state, and local civil servants deliver our mail, teach the next generation in our schools, and handle our garbage so we don't have to live in a 1700 cesspool. Bureaucrats have a fundamental impact that goes largely unnoticed and underappreciated. If we had to go even one week without postal workers, teachers, or sanitation workers, it would quite literally stink. So yeah, while the DMV might be exhausting and 1,000 page laws intimidating, we can appreciate the bigger picture of the bureaucracy if we take a pretty big step back even if Marge at the DMV did take the worst photo of you of all time. If you're enjoying study hall power and politics in US government and are interested in taking an online course and earning college credit, go to gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. Thanks for watching. See you next time.